Source, recently my sister is unusual. Yuya Kanzaki finds himself having a stepsister named Mitsuki. At first, she is cold to him, addressing her stepbrother as you or him, but suddenly one day Mitsuki collapses, which causes Yuya to panic. When Mitsuki awakens in the hospital, she passionately embraces Yuya, calling him her big brother before changing moods again, literally kicking him out of her hospital room. Later on, after a rest at home, she awakens to find a chastity belt on her. Mitsuki then meets Hayori, who calls herself an angel. Before she can ask more, she leaps into Mitsuki's body possessing her. The possession causes the real Mitsuki, who is now transparent, to float outside of her body. Hayori tells Mitsuki not to worry though as she is not Mitsuki to jump back into her own body driving Hiyori out, dismayed. Hiyori then pledges her while talking about her big brother Yuya, resulting in Mitsuki having a high blood pressure that causes a heart located on the chastity belt to fill up a little. Upset that someone might see her chastity belt, she demands Hiyori tell her how to take it off. Hiyori tells of a button that just releases the PP bit which Mitsuki proceeds to press. While explaining about the belt, she is interrupted by Mitsuki who has to use the bathroom. While there the chastity belt clamps back on, Hayori explains that it only stays off for three minutes before going back on and she must wait an hour before pressing it again. Hayori explains that she tried to finish what she was going to say but got interrupted. Mitsuki suffers for an hour in the bathroom worrying both her aunt and Yuya before having the opportunity to go again with great relief. The episode begins with Mitsuki asking Hiyori who she is and asking why she can't cross over. She responds by taking Mitsuki through time and space to steps leading to a big golden gate. Once there she explains that in life she loved Yuya but died before she could confess her feelings. She tells Mitsuki that in order for her to cross over she wants to do lovey-dovey things with him. Each time this happens, from Hiyori, possessing her or Mitsuki's own actions, the heart on the chastity belt fills up a little. Each time the heart is filled a step is added that leads closer to the golden gate. Once full the gate will open allowing Hiyori to cross over. After waking up and thinking it was all a dream, she is then disappointed to find otherwise and then heads off to school. While at school Mitsuki lets Hiyori possess her for gym class and as a result he does really well. When Hiyori tells her that she is doing this to try and draw attention from Yuya Mitsuki's protests, Hiyori continues to say that if after a while Mitsuki does nothing the heart on her belt will drain completely causing both of them to die and go to hell. While at school Mitsuki has the sudden urge to use the restroom. Wrongly thinking that she is sick Yuya takes her to the nurse which ultimately causes Mitsuki to wet herself in front of him. Crying and embarrassed Mitsuki doesn't know how she can face him but is cheered up by Hiyori. At the same time, Yuya has an accident at the grocery store which causes him to take a bath at home with the door's lock broken. After his bath, Mitsuki accidentally sees him naked and then goes to take her own bath. When she tries to get out she discovers that the door is broken, Yuya hears this and explains the door can only be opened from the outside. Yuya says to her that he will open a crack to it so she will be able to get out. Hiyori takes the opportunity and possesses Mitsuki pulling him in there with her which shuts the door and traps them both inside the bathroom. With the two locked in the bathroom, Yuya gives Mitsuki his shirt and the two share bits of their past with each other. The result of the talking causes a reaction in Mitsuki that fills up the heart a little. Yuya calls out for help and is answered by Yukina who comes to let them out. Yukina introduces herself to Mitsuki as Yuya's childhood friend, causing her to become upset while thinking about it. Later on, Hayori furious that Yukina is making moves on Yuya warns Mitsuki about it telling her that relationship stress and jealousy make the heart's contents on the belt drop faster. Hayori possesses her again and flirts with Yuya while trying to humiliate Yukina, the result of which has little effect. Determined, she gets Yuya to admit that he likes both large and small melons to Misuki's embarrassment. The result also causes the heart on the chastity belt to recover and fill more. The next day, an accidental spill causes Yuya to see Misuki's panties. After putting her panties in the wash, she refuses to walk to school with Yuya and Yukina. Hayori suggests that it is jealousy, something Mitsuki blushes to deny. 
Hayori also notices that Yukina is looking directly at her something that she dismisses as not possible. While at school Yuya is embarrassed when thinking of Mitsuki's panties he had accidentally seen earlier. Meanwhile, Mitsuki acknowledges that she forgot to put her panties back on before she came to school after washing them. During lunch, she is invited by Ayaka to join her but declines to notice how windy it is. Yukima hints to her that she knows her problem and helps her out by trying to bring her back inside. Things go okay until a gust of wind exposes her butt to Yuya, causing him to fall back out of shock and hit his head. The episode ends with Mitsuki finding a new pair of panties on her desk that she receives from an unknown person. Yuya meanwhile is in the nurse's office with a headache and memory loss of what happened with Mitsuki. While lying in bed thinking of Yuya Hiyori tells Mitsuki to respond more to him and says that she could be the ideal little sister, something she takes as a challenge. The next day, Hayori possesses her and makes breakfast for Yuya who is surprised. The real Mitsuki watches all of this and dismisses it as sucking up, and has Hiyori reassures her that she won't do excessive body contact or seduction on him. She continues to watch as Hiyori acts very sister-like to Yuya while in her body to the point of causing him a smile. Realizing that he had never smiled at her before the real Mitsuki begins to go deep into thought. Her thoughts are interrupted by Yukina jokingly saying that it looks like the two are on a date. Nika walks by where the real Mitsuki is floating saying, you shouldn't stay separated for too long, causing confusion if she can see her. Later on, Hayori who is still possessing Mitsuki goes to a drainage ditch with Yuya to skip rocks. The real Mitsuki floats nearby thinking of what being real siblings means. While skipping rocks, Yuya talks about his past and of a girl he had as a friend who called him Big Brother. Upon hearing this, Hiyori as Mitsuki jumps into his arms, saying it was her and happy that he remembered. When the real Hiyori tries to intervene, she discovers she can't go back into her own body. Later that night, when she tells her she can't go back into her body, it makes Hiyori want to take advantage of the situation. Hayori as Mitsuki insists she sleeps in Yuya's room with him because she is scared of the thunder and later crawls into bed with him. Hayori then says through Mitsuki that she will be the perfect little sister to him. Yuya responds by saying that she should just be herself. The result of his saying that causes the real Mitsuki who is floating nearby to feel touched and Hiyori to leave her body. Hayori then literally kicks Mitsuki back into her body, in an embarrassment of everything that happened Mitsuki, then kicks Yuya out of his own room. The next day Mitsuki tells Yuya she is going to be as she has always been as he said. Mitsuki and Yuya are invited to a fitness pool center by Ayaka. Once there she runs into Yukina, also present are Shotaro and Mo. Mitsuki who is wearing a bathing suit refuses to go into the water out of embarrassment that her belt might be seen. While watching everyone have fun, Neko introduces herself to Mitsuki and tells her she accompanied them there as her father owns the place. She also tells that her father wanted more opinions from people and allowed them to stay for free if they complied. Mitsuki thinks of Yuya while watching him have fun and reacts after seeing how his friend Shotaro is with his sister Mo. Yuya accidentally hits his head against Yukina's causing him to fall in. Upon seeing this Mitsuki jumps in to help him, but it is not needed as he turns out to be okay. Mitsuki's leg cramps up however, and Yuya carries her out and away someplace to sit. Unknowingly to both of them, Mitsuki's bathing suit had fallen off. Yuya puts her down and is shocked to discover her wearing the belt. To make things worse some people come along to walk by. Yuya apologizes to Mitsuki and then proceeds to kiss her hiding the belt from view and making the people walking by think they are a couple making out. Yuya then takes his swimsuit off causing Mitsuki to scream in embarrassment and the heart on the belt to fill up more. It is shown afterward that Yuya gave her his swimsuit that he wore two pairs of swimwear for some reason. The next day, Yuya thinks of why Mitsuki could be wearing the belt while unconsciously rubbing Mitsuki's panties on his face that had been given back to him. Mitsuki meanwhile, who stayed home from school sick, hits her breaking point and is ready to cut off the belt with scissors when she collapses. Hayori, seeing that the belt on her is not looking good possesses Mitsuki. She then goes on top of Yuya when he comes to check to see if Mitsuki is alright after getting home from school. 
As Hiyori asks Yuya to do her, she comes out of Mitsuki and reveals herself to him. In response, he confusingly asks who she is. Hayori collapses onto Yuya revealing Mitsuki, who calls him an idiot and asks what he is doing. Before he can ask her more about it, she collapses again saying it wasn't her. Mitsuki embraces Yuya while calling out to her mother when he goes to help her out. He then puts her into bed to rest from being sick. The next morning, Hiyori is relieved that Mitsuki is okay however she sees that she still is not fully recovered. Yuya meanwhile asks Yukina for advice but doesn't use Mitsuki's name. He gets some helpful advice from her but comes to the wrong conclusion about why she is wearing the scary panties, referring to her belt. While walking home from school, he gets the chance to talk to her again. Yukina asks Yuya why he thinks she changed from being a tomboy in the past to how she is now but is interrupted before she can get an answer from him. When he gets home Mitsuki, who is possessed by Hiyori, while the real one is sleeping says to Yuya that there is something she needs to tell him. Yuya confusingly thinks about what it could be that Mitsuki wants to tell him and is unsure how to react. While taking a bath Hiyori, possessing Mitsuki, is hesitant but determined to have baby making with Yuya thinking that at the rate things are going with Mitsuki, she will never get to heaven. She then goes into Yuya's room half naked to his embarrassment, but doesn't know how to bring up the topic and stalls long enough for the real Mitsuki to wake up and protest against what Hiyori is doing. Hayori puts Mitsuki back into her own body out of embarrassment just as Yuya tells Mitsuki he is okay with her liking girls. He is worried about the belt though and again misunderstands why he sees her with Hiyori, making Mitsuki wonder how he came up with such a crazy conclusion. Yuya tells her he is okay with her wearing the belt but wishes she would be more careful. Mitsuki cheers up from his overall kind words but kicks him out when he motions to her being half-naked. The episode ends with Yuya reading a thankful note from Mitsuki saying she is going back to school. While sitting and having lunch, Ayaka convinces Mitsuki to look at some school clubs to join. Hayori's object says she wants flirt time with Yuya, but concedes to her just looking and not joining. Mitsuki starts with the tennis club and has Hiyori possess her out of exhaustion. Hayori does great astonishingly the team's captain. He pry pops back out and the captain begs Mitsuki to join saying they could make it to Wimbledon but she refuses. A similar thing occurs when she tries out soccer club. Hayori possesses Mitsuki again and does well. Hayori gets excited when the team captain offers to go to the World Cup. Both are overwhelmed though by all the forms involved which causes Mitsuki in her own body to decline. Mitsuki tries out other clubs with no interest until she gets to the kendo club, where upon seeing Yukina, Hiyori gets interested. With Yuya watching them, the two have a match with Hiyori possessing Mitsuki. However, the man smells too much for her to stand. Hiyori has Mitsuki go back into her body just as Yukina knocks her out. Concerned Yuya runs to her side to find out she is alright. The next one that draws Mitsuki in is the theater club where Nico is rehearsing a play she wrote the scenario for. The play involves Yuya who must choose between his girlfriend played by Nico or his stepsister played by Mo. In the end, he chooses his girlfriend who asks to marry him, but at the last minute, she backs out saying he should go with the person who he is truly in love with. A new bride comes on stage who isn't Mo, but Mitsuki who took her role and says to Yuya, don't fawn over someone who isn't your little sister. Mo who is tied up runs back up on stage to try to reclaim her role but trips on Mitsuki causing the back of her dress to rip, exposing her backside. After screaming she wakes up relieved it was a dream only to find that she is still dreaming. After another false awakening and awake for real now, Mitsuki gets a text from Ayaka telling her not to worry about what happened at school which causes a shocked look on her face. While at school, Yuya receives two tickets to the aquarium from Neiko. Mitsuki arrives home from school first and is shocked to discover a lewd magazine that results in her having a nightmare. When Yuya comes to retrieve his friend's magazine Mitsuki throws it at him upset that he has such a thing not knowing it isn't his. Yuya changes the subject by offering the tickets he had received earlier to her, which makes both Hiyori and Mitsuki excited. Hayori then possesses Mitsuki who blurts out to his surprise how happy she is to go with him. At the aquarium Hiyori, as Mitsuki is overjoyed at the surroundings which makes Yuya happy. 
While looking at an ocean sunfish Mitsuki who is floating nearby asks Hayori why they went with him comparing it to a date. Mitsuki jumps back into her body out of embarrassment, but upon thinking of being on a date with Yuya gets aroused and confused. The result makes her belt feel hot filling up her heart even more and causes Hiyori to feel strange. Later on, Mitsuki and Yuya share their pasts with each other. Mitsuki tells him she now feels strange to have someone be there. When she gets home as her mother left her alone when she went to work, she then asks him if he had a friend named Hiyori when he was little but Yuya tells her he never heard that name before. Hayori tells Mitsuki that she got the name Hiyori from a book and can't remember her real name. While dipping their legs in a tank full of Dr. Fish, Mitsuki has a weird feeling but Yuya insists on holding her legs in the tank thinking she will be fine. The result of the fish sucking and her thinking of him results in another high blood pressure that fills up the heart more. Mitsuki gets upset with Yuya who didn't know that the fish bothered her, but after he apologizes she feels happy. Yuya goes on ahead while they are walking back home turning on all the lights in the house to welcome her back. While in bed, Hiyori then tells Mitsuki that she thinks their synchronization ratio went up saying their hearts are connected. Hayori also goes on to say she will pretend she doesn't notice Mitsuki falling for him too making her embarrassed and causing her to deny it. Nanami brings a kotatsu over to the house before leaving for work. Mitsuki then sees it and uses it while studying math but falls asleep followed by Hayori. When Yuya sees Hayori sleeping with Mitsuki he assumes she is a friend. After noticing her math book he sees that she has the wrong answers and corrects them for her under the kotatsu before falling asleep as well. Mitsuki awakens to find Yuya holding her while sleeping causing her to unsuccessfully try to awaken him with a slap. She dismisses it as him being an airhead, but is touched when she finds the corrected math work he did. When Yuya wakes up Mitsuki blushes while saying thank you, but is confused when he asks where her friend went. The next day Mitsuki makes a bento for Yuya making Hiyori notice that she is acting differently. Hiyori compares it to a newlywed which Mitsuki dismisses as synchronized feelings with her. Mitsuki notices Yuya's bag shortly after but is reluctant about looking inside. Hiyori possesses her though and takes a look. Hiyori decides to pop back out of Mitsuki's body after to her surprise, she notices a second bento. Mitsuki discovers the bento she made before is full while the other one is empty causing her to be upset and swear never to make lunch for him again. Yukina comes over to visit with a bento for Yuya, but sees Mitsuki is upset and offers to cook dinner with her. When Mitsuki starts to refuse Hiyori possesses her and accepts later telling Mitsuki that the bento is most likely a misunderstanding. Yuya goes for a bath before dinner and Mitsuki later jumps back into her body. Yukina tells her that Yuya has been happy receiving the meals Mitsuki makes for him and that she will stop making bento for him while apologizing to her. Yukina accidentally spills dressing on Mitsuki causing her to go for a bath. By chance, Yuya exits and sees her causing her to slap him again while raising the heart on the belt. Later Yuya is seen sitting at the table where he explains that he was saving Mitsuki's lunch for later. Yukina thinks to herself that they are a long way from love. Mitsuki is then seen on the steps to heaven with Hiyori, who is happy she is closer to the gate. Mitsuki asks Hiyori if there is a way to change the design of the chastity belt to which she responds by saying it will be fine the way things are. She then upsets Hidori by bringing up why she isn't doing much herself, including trying to remember more about herself which causes her to leave in anger. As the day goes on Mitsuki is happy to finally get time for herself, but by dinner time feels guilty and upset. Yuya notices and during dinner is able to make her blush with his kindness which confuses Mitsuki as Hayori isn't around. With her heart throbbing thinking about him, Mitsuki then puts her head on the table. Thinking she is choking Yuya picks her up and performs the Heimlich maneuver, which causes her instead to have an high blood pressure. Embarrassed when asked if she is okay, she slaps Yuya leaving him confused. Mitsuki heads to the bathroom where she continues to be confused on why her heart still throbbing for him, she begins to think of love but then denies it in her mind. When using the bathroom she notices the chastity belt is gone, in a panic thinking that Hiyori has crossed over she goes out looking for her. She tries looking to no avail until Yuya who has been worried about looking for Mitsuki shows up. He agrees to help her look for her lost friend who she had a fight with to her relief. 
She finally finds Hiyori in the place where Mitsuki first collapsed and asks her why the chastity belt disappeared, while smiling Hiyori places it back. Mitsuki goes to a nearby bathroom where Hidori explains that she had a new chastity belt made for Mitsuki as she wished and that it never truly disappeared fully. Mitsuki makes up with Hiyori when they get home, but is mortified at the new more revealing belt design preferring the old one. Yuya is last seen in a convenience store asking if anyone had seen a girl with a big ribbon in her hair with wings on her back. In the shopping district, Mitsuki uses four tickets to spin for a chance to win a prize. She ends up winning a trip for two, her and Yuya, to a hot spring. When they arrive at the hot springs, however, Shotaro, Mo, Yukina, Ayaka, Niko, and Nanami are also present due to Hiyori wanting to win a first prize all four times. Yuya offers to carry Mitsuki's bags, but she declines. She gets this awful feeling though when he offers to carry Yukina's bags but dismisses it as Hiyori's connected feeling. Yuya sees that she is upset so to make her feel better he gives her some dorayaki thinking it was due to hunger. When in the female outdoor bath Mitsuki refuses to undress due to the belt on her, Neiko also wears a swimsuit due to a family policy. While in the bath Yukina tells of Yuya's childhood and what it was like which makes Mitsuki think more about it. During dinner, Yuya goes to check on Mitsuki as she had been gone a while. Hapori suggests that she is jealous which she again denies saying it is the result of the synchronizing feelings. When Yuya goes to check on her, Mitsuki brushes him off saying she is fine. Tired of seeing her mope Hiyori then possessed her and heads off to the baths to see Yuya. When they arrive at the bath, both are shocked to see Yukima naked on top of him due to an accidental fall they didn't see. Yuya goes after Mitsuki as she runs off to say she has the wrong idea leaving Yukina behind who mumbles how dense he is. When he catches up to Mitsuki he tells her what really happened and comforts her saying that she is a nice person when she thought otherwise. Weak from the heart on her belt which suffered from the stress, he carries Mitsuki to the game room at the resort to rest which fills the heart more. While in the game room, Mitsuki notices her dorayaki that Yuya had given her earlier and unwraps it. Yukina approaches Mitsuki and takes a bite out of it, saying she is not going to lose to her. Meanwhile, Niko who is watching the whole thing thinks to herself that Yukina is getting carried away, so she wants to shake things up a bit. Yuya encounters Niko that night who asks him how he feels about Mitsuki and Yukina. Unable to get an answer out of him, she puts Yuya into a kind of hypnosis she learned that causes him to be honest with his own desires and how he really feels. By morning when Shotaro can't wake Yuya everyone comes in until he wakes up. He then blurs out that Mitsuki is really cute and proceeds to grope Yukina causing her to slap him. Niko explains the short-term hypnosis she put him under which causes Mitsuki to blush thinking of what he said. Niko tells everyone that if anyone wants to ask him something they maybe will get an unexpected answer. As the day goes on Yuya is sick with a fever, and Mitsuki thinks over what Niko said. Yukina later comes over and talks to Yuya where he tells to her disappointment that she didn't have to change for him. Yukina also lets Mitsuki know she knew about Hayori, but never said anything. Hayori sees the chance to be lovey-dovey after Yukina leaves, but Mitsuki refuses due to his fever. Yuya, meanwhile, is in his bed unable to sleep as he thinks of both Yukina and Mitsuki. He then awakens and bursts through Mitsuki's door causing her to be embarrassed that she is still half-naked. To Mitsuki's surprise, he says that she should stop wearing the scary panties which cause her to kick him out. Hayori then tells Mitsuki that the heart is full and leads her to the now-open Golden Gate. Hayori disappears behind the doors along with the belt on Mitsuki, but not before saying she wants to be reborn as the child Mitsuki and Yuya have. The next day while leaving for school, Mitsuki finally refers to Yuya as Onikin rather than you or him in reference. As the credits roll Mitsuki goes to where she was first possessed by Hiyori only to find her again. Hayori takes her through the golden gate she went through only to have it lead to a floating island with a sign saying 2F on it. With another golden gate visible, Hiyori places the belt back on Mitsuki. Hayori then explains to her that she made the belt 30% more sensitive to make their hearts throb faster together, causing Mitsuki to cry out in embarrassment. 
The story ends, moving on to the OVA episode, it starts with Shotaro's younger sister, Mo having a crush on an older college guy and asking him to the movies. Shotaro and Yuya follow them on their date, but Shotaro gets the wrong idea in the end. It turns out unknowingly to Mo that the person she had a crush on is a female who had no bad intentions in mind. Mo is touched by her brother's kindness, but calls him baldy to save face. The second story takes place during Christmas, where Shotaro, Mo, Yukina, Ayaka, and Niko all have a Christmas party over at Mitsuki's house. Hayori sees it as a time to get closer to Yuya, but acknowledges that Mitsuki is upset about something. Yuya eventually finds out that Mitsuki's birthday was on the 21st, and her mom couldn't be there to celebrate it with her. When Yuya asks her what she wants for her 16th birthday, Hiyori takes the opportunity to possess Mitsuki. She comes out though when Yuya doesn't give what Hiyori was hoping for. In the end, Mitsuki is seen smiling as she receives a new purse from her mother in the mail. Welcome back to Annie Daily. Like and subscribe so you can get 100 girlfriends. The anime starts with a terrified girl who appears to have witnessed some kind of massacre while injured on the floor. Then we see the silhouette of someone covered in armor from head to toe with a red beam emanating from his eye, positively glowing with rage or anger. The scene suddenly shifts, taking us a few moments back in time before the disaster took place. In the town, a rookie priestess fills out the form at the guild to become an adventurer. As soon as she receives her porcelain guild identification card, the lowest level there, a group of adventurers asks her to join them on their quest to hunt some low-level goblins, a piece of cake job for new adventurers. These goblins raided a nearby village, stole from it, and even kidnapped some of the girls there. After getting peer pressure to join the party, the number of its members becomes four, consisting of one knight, monk, mage, and the lovely little priestess. As they enter the cave, the priestess is a bit concerned, especially after discovering that they didn't bring any potions or support items. Her concern proves valid as soon as they see the shrine of the goblins. They are caught in a trap, and goblins pour out of the lair, overwhelming the inexperienced group. The mage gets wounded, and her staff breaks. The knight tries to fend off the goblin mob, but he gets overpowered and defeated. Next, it's the monk's turn, and she holds her own for a bit until she encounters a much bigger goblin that throws her around like a ragdoll. And then the goblins do unspeakable things to her. The priestess tries to escape with the wounded mage, but they get surrounded by goblins. Thankfully, he arrives, the one and only goblin slayer, one of the goblins rushes him and gets his face roasted. The second goblin tries to attack the priestess but receives a sword to the back of the head from Goblin Slayer. He gives the priestess a potion with an antidote for the poison the goblins use, but the mage's injuries are too severe, and she asks to be allowed to rest, which MC grants. They gather information about the cave and learn that a hobgoblin is also present. Looks like a miniboss fight is coming up. Deciding to go back in, MC and the priestess, who still has two more spells left, head deeper into the cave. They find where the knight was torn to shreds and realize that his downfall was due to not noticing the second entrance in the cave, which allowed the goblins to attack from behind, and the impracticality of using a large sword effectively in such a confined space. MC notes that the monk was dragged further into the cave and, presumably, subjected to similar horrors. The priestess tries to rush forward, but MC stops her, revealing an ambush set by a scout. He also warns her that the goblins are likely led by a powerful shaman, a goblin spellcaster. As they proceed, he sets up traps to guard against any incoming goblins. After all, the only goblin he wants is for the priestess to goblin D's nuts. In the inner area of the cave, MC instructs the priestess to use holy light, revealing the presence of six goblins, one hobgoblin, and one shaman. He immediately engages them while they are blinded by the light, going straight for the shaman and killing him with his spear. The enraged goblins chase them, only to fall into the traps he set earlier. MC uses the knight's longsword to pierce the hobgoblin's skull with a single strike, 
and he sets the body on fire, turning part of the attacking force into barbecue while skewering the rest. They later find the girl from earlier with her clothes torn, indicating what she had endured. MC then discovers a secret door leading to young goblins. The priestess can't bear the thought of killing them too, but MC explains that it's necessary since they learn from the mistakes of the dead and hold grudges for life. The scene shifts to the little goblins, and all that can be heard are their heads being squished as they squeal and scream in terror, making the total kill count 22. All this would make even Anakin Skywalker ask, why would you kill the young ones too? At the end of the day, MC saved the girls and claimed the bounty on that cave, something MC is accustomed to since goblins frequently pillage and kidnap girls to use as playthings, kill inexperienced adventurers, rinse, and repeat. That said, the main man's routine shakes up a bit as the priestess joins his party in hunting goblins. After all, what's a fantasy anime without a love interest? In the second episode, we meet his childhood friend, the well-endowed redhead farmer girl. She tries to make some small talk with him as usual and then tells him that she will prepare breakfast. The cute chick narrates our boy's daily routine, which includes checking around the whole village for any footprints or proof that goblins were near his village and the fences. Goblins move at night and send scouts out to the villages they are about to raid first. Once he was done checking the perimeter, he sat and ate, with his helmet on like weff. Then he went off to the village to accept any new quests from the guild. As long as it's goblins, he will take it as he never takes any other quests unless it's about goblins. Meanwhile, a poor fellow submitted a quest to kill goblins around his property. In the guild, G Slayer is treated by the rest of the adventurers as an outcast due to his low-quality armor and his habit of only accepting goblin-related quests despite his status as a high-ranked adventurer. Nevertheless, the guild receptionist is always delighted to see him and respects his dedication to eradicating all goblins, adding the fact that money isn't an issue with him at all, and he doesn't mind the low bounties placed on these jobs he takes. He is literally a man on a mission to do one thing and one thing only, kill all goblins, and he is pretty dang good at it as well. With everyone fighting over the high-level quests, MC just sat behind, chilling until the crowd left. He then heads to the reception to receive a quest and finds out that another group of rookie adventurers took on a goblin-slaying quest. After receiving their details, the G-Man has some banter with the priestess about whether they should head over to save them or not. Wow, an adventure hook. Do you think he bites? The question is soon answered. On their way there, MC revealed to the priestess his dark, sad origins. When he was a young boy, his village was attacked by goblins who killed nearly all of the villagers, including cowgirl's parents. There he witnessed the gang attack and subsequent murder of his elder sister by goblins. This broke his mind beyond recovery and was the sole reason he trained so hard and learned how to effectively eradicate goblins as revenge for the suffering they caused him and his sister. However, this also caused him to become socially withdrawn and awkward with crowds. Funny enough, while telling her this sad story, he was casually raining flaming arrows over the fortress, setting it on fire. Next, he ordered the priestess to make a holy wall at the entrance to stop them from escaping, so they either die burning or suffocating by smoke. In the end, it rained and the fire was put out, which made him glad as he wanted to make sure that none of the goblins escaped before then returning home to be greeted by his cute childhood friend. Wanna hear a joke? A high elf archer, a dwarf shaman, and a lizard priest walk into a bar, and they all cry, ouch. Anyways, these three ask the guild girl for an adventurer called Orkbold, and she replies, Nani? What the heck is that? They then ask for beard cutter, but the guild girl is still lost. After some bickering and confusion, it turns out they were looking for MC, and they were referring to the guy in their race's native tongues. The madman arrives and sees the trio, who asks to talk to him. While MC is busy with the group, Priestess gets approached by a well-rounded witch who is an acquaintance of MC. After this, some rookie adventurers tried to convince Priestess to leave MC's party and join them, assuming he was only using Priestess as bait, and because of his brooding and unfriendly attitude towards others. Well, that and his unhealthy obsession with goblins. High Elf Archer explains to MC that their races have united with the human kingdoms to fight against the resurrected Demon Lord's army, and they want to hire him for a related quest. 
MC refuses at first, obviously much to High Elf Archer's anger, as demons are not his concern. His name is Goblin Slayer after all, not Demon Slayer, though I think there's a relatively unknown anime by that name. However, Dwarf Shaman and Lizard Priest mention ruins in Elven lands, which are occupied by goblins since the elves cannot mobilize their army due to political concerns and tension among races. Orc Bold immediately accepts the quest, since it has goblins in it and leaves the room. The trio then are baffled by his actions, and the fact he was ready to go off and fight them on his own. Priestess also joins their quest after calling out MC for not asking if she wanted to join after he kept insisting that she needed rest. It's quite a cute notice me senpai moment, as the group makes camp and enjoys their race's food. A drunken high elf archer berates MC for his rude behavior while the others talk about where goblins came from. The next day, the mission starts with the high elf archer killing the goblin sentries at the ruins, allowing the group to walk in like bosses. <laughs> when the group enters the ruins, they encounter a well-set-up trap. He then notices there are no totems, suggesting the shaman does not lead these goblins. Does that mean anything, you might ask? Well, to G-Slayer, these are some of the most concerning issues since a smart, wise shaman should be leading these goblins, as opposed to the situation here. It stirs up some concern in the party, leading them to the fact that someone is leading them. The dwarf tells the party that the goblins went left, however, Orc Bold decides to go right. Everyone questions his reasoning but still goes with him anyway. In the waste disposal room of the goblins, an elvish girl is tied up to the wall and covered with wounds. She says, kill, you must kill, and without any hesitation, MC walks up to the chick. Anakin, no. Priestess shouts at him, don't kill her, but what she doesn't realize is that the elf was talking about the goblin hiding behind her in the shadows. After rescuing the elven prisoner tortured by goblins, the shaman summons his dragon tooth familiar to escort her out of the dungeon and take her back to town. That's a clever way to get around a boring escort quest. After witnessing the savagery of the goblins, the angry high elf archer vows to avenge her fellow kin and promises to kill all goblins in the dungeon. They then begin the cleansing process, hunting down any goblins they meet on their way. The group then finds a hall where the goblins are resting. MC's group uses sleep and silence spells to incapacitate the goblins there before they can sound any kind of alarm. Then, Orc Bold, the Shaman and the Ranger start to kill them off one at a time. However, their silence alerts the goblins' leader, an ogre, one of the demon lord's generals, yet the main man is not impressed with the two stories tall monster, not even a little intimidated by his 68 abs on him. So to assert dominance, the ogre attacks the group using his strength and fire magic, forcing the priestess to use two protection spells back to back to keep his powerful spell at bay. The party tries to fight him, but he proves to be too difficult to kill due to his large size and ability to heal quickly. Add to that, the fact that Orkbold seems to everyone to be dead after the powerful blow he sustained. After consuming the health potion, MC stands back up and returns to the battle. Just like in video games after all. If you can't dodge, chug those HP potions. He uses his trump card, a magic teleportation scroll given to him by the witch, which sends strong jets of water from the bottom of the ocean to damage the ogre. Then, from the dust, our main man walks out like a beast with his eyes glowing before giving him the killing blow. Chills, man, I tell you. Chills. As elvish reinforcements arrive to take over the ruins, MC's group heads back to the city. Her experience with MC and his obsession makes High Elf Archer want to take MC on a proper adventure. Adventures are supposed to be fun, after all. After recovering from his wounds, MC helps cowgirl cart supplies to the town. There he meets with High Elf Archer, Dwarf Shaman, and Lizard Priest. Our boy tells them he is open to the idea of exploring some ruins with them. The priestess informs him she has been promoted to the next adventurer rank and formally thanks MC for saving her life. He then encounters two young adventurers who lost a sword in the sewers and advises them to use a club as an improvised weapon so they can retrieve it. 
Gil Girl asks him to act as an observer on a promotion exam, where she punishes a Ria's scout for stealing loot from his party. The Ria's scout considers attacking Gil Girl but is dissuaded by MC's presence. Meanwhile, the two young adventurers recover the sword thanks to MC's advice. MC then receives a special goblin slaying request from Sword Maiden herself, asking for him by name. It's exposition time. Ten years ago, a group of heroes, including Sword Maiden, slew the original Demon Lord. Currently, the new hero and her companions are fighting back the resurrected Demon Lord in another area and have their hands full. Their priority is to crush the Demon Lord and his army before they become too much of a problem to handle. However, some of the Demon Lord generals are scattered across the country, wreaking havoc on the surrounding areas. MC and the rest of the party journey to Watertown, where they meet Sword Maiden, who is now retired from heroism. Sword Maiden informs them there has been a string of violent murders in the town recently, and they suspect the culprits are goblins in the town's sewer system, especially after they found a body of a slain goblin clad in leather armor. Since the RB won't mobilize to fight goblins and other adventurers have failed and lost their lives, she decides to reach out to MC, thanks to his great reputation for killing these buggers. MC, of course, agrees to the quest and leads the party into the sewers, where they are attacked by no less than five waves of goblins. Venturing further into the sewers, they discover that goblins have learned to use boats to navigate through the waterways. This puzzles MC and brings great concern to him, as goblins have never been smart enough to use boats before. After sinking a goblin boat, the party attracts the attention of a giant alligator, which they take advantage of by tricking it into destroying the rest of the goblin fleet. Priestess uses holy light on its giant tail, and since goblins associate light with adventurers, they attack each other while the party makes their escape. As they return to the surface, MC is troubled that the goblins knew how to use boats yet were unaware of the alligator, leading him to conclude that somebody had placed the goblins in the sewers. He adds that it wasn't just them naturally multiplying in there. After a brief rest in town, MC and his party venture back into the sewers to investigate the source of the goblins. This time around, Slayer brings along a canary to warn them of any poison gas as a precaution. The party delves deeper into the sewers but is led into a trap and locked in a tomb. The goblins also begin to pump poison gas into the room, agitating the canary and warning the party. However, thanks to his quick thinking and the collective teamwork of his party, each using their strengths, they manage to successfully seal off the vents to prevent the gas from entering. With their plan to kill them with gas gone with the wind, the goblins then resort to attacking the party directly, revealing a goblin champion is leading them. The mage and archer stand behind the barrier and bombard the goblins with all they have, while the priestess makes sure to keep up her shield and barrier. Meanwhile, Slayer and the shaman attack head-on, clearing the wave coming towards them until they reach the goblin champion. The goblin champion hits MC as if he was a baseball, critically wounding him. As soon as the priestess sees the condition he is in, she panics and loses her concentration, and the protective barrier is dispelled, allowing the barbaric goblins to swarm the archer and pin her to the ground. The dwarf immediately rushes to her rescue, leaving priestess unprotected and open for attacks. The champion uses that chance and attacks Priestess, as the goblins overwhelm the rest of the party, biting a piece of her shoulder. Motivated by Priestess' screams, MC regains consciousness and attacks the goblin champion from behind, tearing his right eye out in the process. The goblin champion and his minions flee, giving the party the chance to regroup. Priestess' wounds are healed, but MC collapses from his injuries. He wakes up in the Temple of Law, having been healed with a resurrection miracle, where he is supposed to sleep with a virgin maiden. The sword maiden then enters the room and tells MC of her past, how she was attacked and tortured by goblins ten years ago, which is the source of her scars and partial blindness. Despite being one of the heroes who slew the Demon King, she still deeply fears goblins. Later, Elf Archer, Dwarf, and Lizard decide to continue scouting the sewers, while NC and Priestess spend the day in town recovering and repairing their gear since their armors were totaled in that last encounter. Witch and Spearman arrive to deliver a mysterious package to MC. 
Meanwhile, Cowgirl continues to wait for MC's return, despite her uncle's warnings that he may not come back one day. The next day, the party heads back to the sewers and finds a room guarded by a powerful demon with a stinky, slimy eyeball with tendrils. Not only that, but it also has its powerful disintegration ray as well as dispel, which renders half the party's arsenal useless. MC uses the package, which contains fine flour, and spreads it around the room to create a dust explosion, while the lizard summons a dragon tooth warrior and the archer shoots at it one last time before the priestess uses protection, and the stupid demon practically fries itself. The explosion kills the demon, allowing the party to investigate the mysterious mirror it was guarding. The party discovers the mirror is a gate linking the sewers of Watertown with the green moon, allowing goblins to enter. As Lizard Priest works to remove the mirror from the wall, the rest of the party repels the goblin counterattack led by the goblin champion, barricading themselves and fighting them from a distance. Once the mirror is loose, MC has the party take shelter under it, while Dwarf Shaman collapses the roof on their heads, killing all goblins, including the champion, and smashing them under the rubble. The party is kept safe thanks to the portal mirror. They encase the mirror in cement and sink it in the river, as they can't guarantee other goblins won't learn to use it. MC reports to Sword Maiden, revealing he suspects she knew more than she let on. Sword Maiden admits the giant alligator is her familiar that guards the sewers, while the mirror was placed by a cult of demon worshippers, whom the hero had already wiped out. Even though the masterminds were taken out, Sword Maiden delayed doing anything about the goblins because she secretly wanted other people to understand the cruelty goblins are capable of. MC merely replies that he cannot save her from her trauma, but he will kill goblins if she asks him, even in her dreams, alleviating her worries. On the way back to their town, MC tells the rest of the party he plans to make ice treats, and the party promises to help him. In other news, the hero's defeat of the demon lord and his army is confirmed, and she becomes the tenth person ever to achieve a platinum rank. Festivities are held across the land. Meanwhile, MC continues his daily chores and accompanies Cowgirl to the town to get his armor repaired. While there, he sees veteran adventurers training rookie adventurers when he encounters the rest of his party, who invite him out for lunch, with Cowgirl and Guild Girl also joining. During the meal, Guild Girl notes the Guild has started a program to have retired adventurers train rookie adventurers, so retired adventurers stay employed, and rookie adventurers have a better chance of surviving. Cowgirl wonders if MC will ever retire. The next day, MC performs more chores around the farm and reads a letter from Sword Maiden, thanking him for his help and telling him she no longer sees goblins in her dreams. That night, Cowgirl shares a moment with MC and tells him he should think about his future. Going to bed, she reflects on the fact MC can't kill goblins forever and wonders what will happen when that time comes. The next day, MC does his daily patrol around the farm and discovers goblin footprints. He concludes that a horde of over a hundred goblins will attack the farm soon. He warns Cowgirl he cannot fight that many goblins in the open and urges her to run, but she refuses to abandon her home for a second time. MC heads to town to ask the other adventurers for help. They refuse at first since there's no quest or reward posted for fighting the goblin horde. MC then offers everything he owns, equipment, assets, knowledge, and time, as the reward for helping him fight. Sensing how serious MC is about the situation, Spearman and Witch agree to fight with him, as well as the two rookie adventurers MC helped, and MC's party also joins without question, for the rewards of food or drink afterward or him joining an adventure. Guild Girl then announces that she's posted a bounty of one gold for each dead goblin, which convinces the rest of the adventurers to join. MC warns that the horde is being led by a goblin lord, a highly intelligent goblin specializing in leadership. He devises an effective strategy for the adventurers to fight the horde, and the first few waves of goblins are easily defeated. The goblin lord then sends several hobgoblins and goblin champions at the adventurers and attempts to flee but is intercepted by MC, who came out of the woods with his drip and that chilling red eye glow. At this moment, the goblin lord knew he messed up. Oh, I'm in danger. 
while the veteran adventurers slay the hobgoblins and goblin champions, N.C. fights the goblin lord alone, but is defeated. However, when N.C. is about to be killed, Priestess casts two protection spells to trap the goblin lord. The goblin lord attempts to trick Priestess by begging for mercy. But this fails, and M.C. kills him. It's revealed that this was all part of his plan, acting as bait so Priestess could entrap the Lord. After all the goblins are killed and the farm secured, the adventurers return to the guild to celebrate where M.C. confides in Cowgirl that he has started to pick up an interest in becoming an adventurer. He removes his helm at Priestess' request as her reward, and the other adventurers are surprised to see his face for the first time. In the epilogue, Priestess narrates that N.C. is just another pawn on the board to the gods, but the gods have taken an interest in him due to his refusal to let the gods roll the dice on his actions, meaning his fate is completely unknown to them. She then remarks that N.C. is still out there fighting. The next story continues with a group of adventurers fighting goblins in a snowy plain. They are led by a blonde swordswoman, with several other young girls in their party accompanied by a group of older men. Through a combination of weapon blows and a large area of effect spells, they absolutely wipe the floor with the goblins, leaving their sprawled bodies scattered across the field. It's because we get to face goblins that adventurers are worth going on, the group believes. Their leader assures everyone she will always have a brilliant plan before the scene changes. It's been a while since then and the Sword Maiden has sent a request out for Goblin Slayer's help. The tale begins with a noble's daughter who left home to become an adventurer. She departed after accepting a quest and hasn't been heard from since. Her parents request the guild find her. This isn't a rare occurrence since she is an adventurer after all. However, the problem is that the girl took a Goblin Slaying quest. And if you know anything about the anime, you can guess how well it's going to go. M.C. goes with his party to try and find her. They first stop by a village, where they fend off a goblin attack. Priestess has a hard time fighting them, but she uses her spells to blind the goblins, whereupon M.C. takes the opportunity to bash their heads in. His name is Goblin Slayer after all. What did you expect? The Sword Maiden was contacted by the guild and sent a letter to M.C. since he was the most reliable one she could count on for the job. Please consider lending a helping hand to that poor girl she requests of him. While they're fending off the goblins, several of the little gremlins try to use their captured villagers as hostages, but Dwarf Shaman gives them a little whiff of his flask, and they pass out like a bunch of freshmen at their first frat house party. While they're asleep, Lizard Priest prowls through their ranks, striking them down one after another. Meanwhile, High Elf Archer leaps from rooftop to rooftop, nailing the goblins from afar as they try to escape. Their level of teamwork is something my Dungeons & Dragons table could only hope to achieve. With the enemies near them disposed of, MC turns to Priestess and compliments her spell usage during their fight, causing her to blush and thank him. However, when she turns to him, she realizes he's examining the dead bodies. I have a bad feeling about this, he says as he counts the goblins. The problem he sees is how the dead villagers' bodies are still intact, and how the goblins took hostages instead of just killing them like usual. Priestess asks him if he thinks there might be an ogre or something leading them, but he can only guess as to their intentions. Back at the town center, the townspeople are just beginning to wake up, hugging each other, being confused, or just generally glad to be alive. Lizard Priest and Dwarf Shaman are helping clean things up, before they count the rest of the goblins. There's a problem. We counted 19, but weren't there 20 of them at first? MC and Priestess offer to help the villagers rebuild and heal, for which they are really grateful. The chief thanks them personally, but before anything can happen, the last goblin springs out of hiding and makes a run for it. High Elf Archer immediately takes her bow and leaps into the air to shoot it using an arrow MC tosses to her. She realizes the tip is wiggly and the arrow goes wide, letting the goblin pull it out of the shoulder and run into the woods. When she confronts MC about this, he tells her he did that on purpose. MC then turns his attention back to the villagers, asking them for information on any adventurers who came through before them, as well as a map of the area. When the village elder mentions payment, the ever so gracious MC tells them not to worry. Goblins come first. That night, the girls relax in the village hot springs together, 
High Elf Archer teases Priestess about her melons, expressing envy at how they seem to keep on growing, causing Priestess to blush and have a cute reaction. She quickly changes the topic, asking where the others are. High Elf Archer tells her not to worry about them, since they're all probably being weird somewhere. Lizard Priest and his crippling alcohol addiction, Dwarf Shaman and his crippling dirt addiction, and of course, MC with his crippling goblin addiction. In fact, he's keeping watch right now, a fact which High Elf Archer definitely gives him some flack for, advising Priestess to make a move before he dies old and stiff. Their conversation then turns to High Elf Archer's reasons for leaving her forest, and Priestess asks her whether it was because she got bored. It turns out she was only partially right. The elf did have a duty and felt fulfilled doing it, but one day she saw a leaf being carried downstream and watched as it disappeared beyond her sight. She wondered where it led, chasing after it through the trees, and soon enough she was outside encountering the human world for the first time. Say, humans die after living about a hundred years, right? She asks while playing with Priestess' hair, I wonder what that's like. In response, Priestess assures her there would always be things one wishes they had or could experience for themselves. Later, the party meets with the villagers to try and gather as much information as they can about the party they were chasing. It turns out, when the party was last seen, they seemed kind of malnourished and exhausted. Goblin Slayer deduces they were probably staying out, even in the winter, to try and starve out the goblins. He senses something wrong about this, and the group sets out to try and find them. Along the way, as they struggle through the Soviet winter Napoleon style, High Elf Archer asks MC about the crooked arrow he gave her. The arrow was poisoned and MC intended for the goblin to return, spreading the sickness and crippling the goblin nest. That way, they would be weakened when the group arrived. It certainly wouldn't kill them all, but it would be a devastating blow. The group soon stumbled upon the entrance to the nest, where they take a break and eat together around a campfire. They've decided to go into the nest at dusk, using the time to talk to each other and learn about their backstories. High Elf Archer asks Lizard Priest more about his goal of becoming a dragon, and they discuss the various tales of their travels before finishing their meal and approaching the cave. The goblins have set all manner of traps along the way, but the party is now an expert at goblin tactics. When the goblins try to ambush them, Priestess casts a light spell to illuminate everything before the party charges in to take them out. In the chaos, one goblin manages to shoot High Elf Archer in the leg. When they pull out the shaft, MC realizes the goblins have learned and are purposefully loosening their own arrow tips. If you're not familiar with this concept, it's what some hunters used to do in the past, where they let the arrowhead get stuck in their prey, weakening them over time. The party sets up around the elf and pulls the arrowhead out, using a hot dagger to cauterize the wound. The damage isn't too bad and they stagger on. Before long, they find the missing fencer girl on an altar. Everything seems a bit suspicious, what with the strange symbols on the altar and the brand on the girl's neck. Priestess recognizes the symbol as that of the cult of the Green Moon, who worship the god of wisdom. The cult is an inherently goblin one at that, much like the orc gods of 40k. He's quite a devious and mischievous god, but High Elf Archer doesn't understand why he would support the goblins. They deduce this god must have some sort of follower, but whoever is healing goblins and attacking people is likely a follower of evil. At first, they think it might have been a goblin priest, but they then realize it must have been a goblin paladin. Cue the dramatic music. Now, a short rewind to when Fencer and her party first set up camp outside of the goblin cave. The party discusses their options and reaffirms their plan. They decide to set up a fence around the cave exit and wait for the starving goblins to come out one at a time so they can kill them easily. This plan is based on the idea that the goblins are dumb, but they stop falling for their trap the next day. The party itself starts running low on rations and suffering in the cold, but at Fencer's insistence, they stay to keep watch. The party cohesion shatters as most of their members try to convince her to give up. She eventually is forced to return to the village for help, but her willpower begins to weaken just as quickly as her strength. That night, disaster strikes. Sensing weakness, the goblins burst out of their hideout and murdered the rest of her party while she was asleep. When she wakes up, she sees their heads and freaks out. But when she reaches for her sword, she finds it frozen and stuck. 
Weakened and with no weapon, she is easily overwhelmed. Back in the present day, Fencer wakes up safe and sound in a bed in the village, with MC sharpening his sword while watching over her. She asks him about her party, only to have her nightmare confirmed. He asks her about what she was trying to do, and she seems to express a desire to get revenge on the goblins, muttering MC's name several times while watching him leave. In the tavern below, Priestess fills the party in on the God of Wisdom. He's a rather peculiar god, being concerned only with the acquisition and spread of knowledge. Although some gods may care about such grandiose affairs as justice or love, the Green Moon cares only about knowledge. Thus, he is more than willing to grant power to any knowledge-seeking follower of his, whether they may be humans, elves, or even goblins. Whatever the reason, the problem is still goblins and their lair must be nearby. Examining the map, the party discovers a dwarven ruin nearby and resolves to check it out. Dwarf Shaman tells them, it'll be downright stupid to attempt a frontal assault, so they start thinking about alternative ways to get in. Just then, however, Fencer comes downstairs clutching a dagger and declares she wants to join them on their quest. Naturally, the party declines and tells her they were sent on a quest to save her, so it would be ridiculous of them to put her in danger again. However, she tells them she has to get back everything she lost. The party is willing to hear her out, though High Elf Archer protests about her losing her life, only to be told in turn all of them might die, so they should worry about what they can do while they're alive, than to worry about what they can't do when they're dead. That's some words of wisdom for you right there. Fencer cuts her long hair and tells them she will pay them now for this quest, but she will be going with them no matter what. With Priestess assurances, NC agrees to take Fencer on her revenge quest, and the party sets off to do what the title on the box says. It's Goblin Slaying Time. They plan to have the guys carry the girls as fake prisoners, and NC offers them some rings to keep them warm as well as a drape over their cart. Lizard Priest pretends to be their leader, the Bishop of the Green Moon. With a bit of magic and top-tier improvising, he convinces them they're here to bring the girls as sacrifices, and the party goes to prison cells, where they see more of the goblins' victims chained up in the dungeons. Once a goblin starts tearing at Priestess' hair and opens the cage, Fencer unleashes her wrath on the little green dude's face, beating him to a pulp without a care for her own well-being. When the other goblins try to raise the alarm, MC quickly silences them before they even get to make a sound. Priestess' face gets cut in the process, and MC decides to leave her and Fencer here to save the other prisoners, while Lizard Priest and Dwarf Shaman head off to ready the next part of their plan. High Elf Archer confronts MC about bringing Fencer back to the source of her trauma, but he shows a bit of weakness and confesses he understands how she feels. After all, he himself felt that same rage after seeing his village massacred and his sister abused. The elf is surprised at hearing this, but it does serve to humanize him a bit in their eyes. After ensuring the hostages are taken care of, they leave them in the dungeons and search out the goblin armory. When they arrive, they discover amongst the weapons and armor a bunch of mining equipment, which Dwarf tells them is likely due to reinforcement techniques. Using one of his spells, Lizard Priest causes all the goblins' weapons to rust away before the party goes to take a look at the goblin festival outside. There's a ton of ruckus there as the goblins wail and beat their drums, while the goblin paladin approaches and takes his seat on the throne in the center. That's when they realize their mistake. The goblins are having a coronation ceremony for the goblin paladin, which is why there are so many of the green monsters gathered in the castle courtyard. But all coronations need a sort of priest or cleric to carry out, and there's a small issue with that. Remember the goblin fencer beat up in the dungeon? Well, he was the priest. This means the goblins have immediately realized something was wrong. The brand on Fencer's neck begins to heat up, causing her to let out these uncontrollable screams of agony as she's forced to relive her torture at the goblins' hands. Her wails let the goblins hone in on them and the goblin paladin immediately reverses the odds. As a cloud of arrows falls onto their position, MC and Lizard Priest shield their teammates as they quickly discuss their new plan. Lizard Priest would go help get the prisoners out, while the others would either distract the goblins or sabotage the castle as they escape. Fencer has another breakdown as her PTSD triggers, and MC responds with his classic solution. Did a goblin do you dirty? Very well. I will simply have to kill them all. 
He lights a fire on the ground to distract the goblins before he, Fencer, and Priestess run off to try and get her sword back. While they fight their way across the castle walls, Priestess helps encourage and calm Fencer, eventually allowing her to overcome her trauma to some degree. Meanwhile, Lizard Priest, Dwarf Shaman, and High Elf Archer sabotage the castle's food supply and blow a hole in the side of the walls, timing everything to when MC's party brings down a large section of scaffolding. The chaos kills plenty of goblins, crushing them and knocking them to their deaths far below. However, as any gamer would know, kill enough minions and the boss will soon appear. The goblin paladin shows up to let them know what he thinks about their escape. Brandishing Fencer's own top-tier sword, the paladin breaks MC's sword and challenges him to a duel. To prevent the others from interfering, he activates the brand on Fencer's neck again before he and MC engage in a short duel. Fencer still manages to unleash a lightning blast and wipes out the boss minions before they make their escape by jumping off with a rope. When the party makes it out, they immediately sprint away with the literal entire goblin army in tow. MC, Dwarf Shaman, and High Elf Archer make their stand fighting a rearguard action together, causing a mini avalanche that obliterates the rest of the chasing monsters. Although Elf Archer's arrows take out many of the goblins, the Paladin is easily able to either block their attacks or simply use his minions as a meat shield. As they run to the nearby valley, they set up to meet the remainder of the goblins in a narrow corridor. MC takes the Goblin Paladin on once more, though he can immediately tell the Paladin has learned from their duel last time. His swordsmanship is now on par with MC's. However, using his shield as bait, MC gets the Paladin to embed his sword into his shield before cutting his head off. With their leader dead, the Goblins hesitate and give enough time for Fencer to cast one of her most powerful spells, calling down massive bolts of lightning in the area and roasting most of the remaining Goblins. Unfortunately, the blast also triggers a landslide and Priestess has to use her protection spell to save whoever she can. It doesn't manage to shield MC and he gets carried away toward the bottom of the slope. Worried for his safety, the party goes to look for him but seems to laugh a little recognizing he is indeed the protagonist, and there's just no way he could die like that. Their plan comes full circle when it's revealed why MC had given them all water-breathing rings. Without them, he would have been suffocated under the weight of the snow. Regardless, everyone is safe now and Fencer's sword has been retrieved. He returns it to her, causing her to break down in tears as she finally reclaims what she has lost. With his absolute knack for words, MC walks up to her, telling her she sure cries a lot. Thus, the party finishes their quest and returns to the Adventurer's Guild, just in time to celebrate the Winter Festival together. Fencer tells them she's going to return to her friends and family now, after having abandoned them for so long. She thanks the party greatly for what they've done and promises to write letters to them in the future. As the girls talk, Priestess realizes both Guild Girl and Cowgirl have affections for MC and goes to visit him while he's keeping watch. She brings him a New Year's gift and joins him at his campfire, hoping to talk to him about something other than goblins. But he just keeps talking about goblins and their new strategies. MC tells her he usually keeps watch here every year, but he's become even more worried after seeing what the goblins were working on in the fort. Not only were they better organized and in larger numbers, but also they were practicing metallurgy and weaponsmithing. He can't ever let his guard down against such an enemy. But after some time, however, MC eventually shows a little growth and confesses he's also quite nervous around social gatherings, though he's more than happy to see them all enjoying themselves. Nevertheless, he's only still human and asks Priestess to stay beside him for the next year as well, closing out the scene with a nice moment between the two. With these affairs out of the way, we take the chance to rewind and experience some earlier and more light-hearted events, if such a thing is even possible in the Goblin Slayer universe. In the morning one day, Cowgirl wakes up and finds Goblin Slayer already up and geared up. The sun is just rising, making the farm look all pretty and stuff just like your classical fantasy world. This story is about MC's own backstory, and as such focuses on his childhood friend Cowgirl. As she yawns and fully wakes up, she checks out MC while he puts on his cool armor and weapon, all focused and determined. Each day, MC does his thing by checking the farm's security, 
making sure everyone's safe. He moves fast and efficiently, looking for any signs of goblins lurking around. Those nasty critters always leave some clues before attacking, and NC's sharp eyes scan the ground for any hints of their presence. If he doesn't find any footprints, he inspects the fence, making sure it's all good with his gloved hands. He's super picky, even the tiniest issues don't get past him, and he fixes them himself, getting wood and a stake. MC is deadly serious about protecting the farm and its folks from those goblin jerks. After all, they just steal people's girls. Cowgirl watches him with starry eyes, totally admiring him and feeling all secure knowing he's on the case. She knows he's the hero they need to kick goblin butts after all. There's a flashback to their younger days when MC and Cowgirl were like BFS. One time, she wanted to bring him something nice from the city, but he turned her down, saying he didn't need anything. She got all mad because she just wanted to do something sweet for her friend. But the story ain't over yet. Later, her uncle took her away for some reason, but even then, she couldn't stop thinking about MC. His undying spirit to fight goblins left a big mark on her, and she respected his courage and dedication. As she left, she kept MC's image in her mind, hoping he'd keep on kicking goblin butts with no fear. Back to the present, some desperate folks ask MC for help against powerful demons, which is pretty intense, almost like the goblin threats MC deals with all the time. At first, MC's like, hmm, I'm all about goblin smashing, not demon hunting. But the demon info gets him curious, especially when they mention goblins. He studies the map really hard, getting more and more determined to take on these new baddies. Priestess steps up, believing in MC's skills, and volunteers to join the group on the crazy mission. After all, she wants to be with her hero. After some thought, MC agrees, forming his usual diverse squad, and soon they're all ready to face the demons, feeling a mix of fear and determination. The road ahead is dangerous, but with Priestess by his side and a surprisingly newfound sense of growth, MC is ready for the challenge. With no time to waste, they head out to the goblins' hideout, the tension rising as they carefully navigate the dangerous terrain. They know their job, get rid of the goblin threat and bring peace back to the land. It's not much, but it's honest work. The dense forest soon surrounds them, and they feel the weight of what's to come. Each member knows the risks and how important their mission is, having been through it multiple times at MC's side. When they finally get to the goblin's lair, MC takes charge, planning a tactical attack and assigning roles based on everyone's skills. The squad's in position, ready to kick goblin butts. High Elf Archer picks many of them off from afar, while MC's experience makes him a natural leader. When the battle starts, swords clash and battle cries fill the air as the goblins try to swarm the party. With skill and talent, MC swiftly takes down goblins, finding their weak spots and fighting like an absolute boss. Even when the goblins keep coming, MC's team stands strong, showing some serious guts and determination. As the battle reaches its climax and the pressure gets crazy, the goblin chief shows up, all powerful and scary and eager to flex those large green muscles. But the team isn't about to just give up like that, even when they're in such a terrible position. Although they start getting wounded, they're ready to fight with all they've got. They push forward unwaveringly and fight like warriors. MC's brilliance shines as he outsmarts the goblins with clever strategies, weakening their forces with each move as he bashes heads and slashes until everything around him is dead. The air is electric, and everyone knows they must protect each other no matter what, always watching out for each other during the battle. Together, they face the big horde of goblins and their scary leader, ready to fight till the end. Have it thee! MC goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the goblin chief in an epic duel. Their weapons clash, and both refuse to back down. That is, until MC is caught by surprise and sent careening into a wall. However, with a little flashback no jutsu, MC is determined to shield his friends and wipe out the goblin menace once and for all, so he somehow manages to overcome life-threatening injuries and kill everything in his way. Eventually, MC gets the upper hand and takes down the goblin chief. With their leader out of the game, the rest of the goblins freak out and run away, like the cowards they are. The cries soon fade into the distance, like my hopes and dreams in college. After the intense battle, the squad takes a moment to catch their breath, 
hearts still pounding. Even though it was tough, they won and their bond is stronger than ever. They proved the power of sticking together and being ready to face anything that comes their way. Thus, the Goblin Slayer legend goes on. It sure is nice being a protagonist, isn't it? Let me just watch this Chainsaw Man show real quick. I'm sure all the protagonists there have plot armor too, right? 